Danny Haifong, the one and only, an absolute internet sensation in the United States, a specialist in China-US relations uh, and an expert talker to Danny. Thanks very much for joining us for your first time, but I hope not the last on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, let me ask you something kind of, uh, it's a slight diversion just for a minute, but it's something that's important to me and I'm sure to you. I have a, an Asian wife and three Asian children. I've been horrified by the pictures I've seen, the spike of murderous violence against Asian people in America, uh, not just politically related, but COVID related. Uh, people pushing people under trains and stabbing them and beating them in the streets. Has that abated somewhat or is it still a real crisis? Oh, no, it is still a real crisis. In New York City alone, we've had a number of these attacks even within the last month to the point where in Chinatown you see long lines of Chinese women and women of Asian descent looking to pick up pepper spray. There is a feeling that the United States just is not safe for people of the diaspora anymore, of the uh, Southeast Asian diaspora, those of Chinese descent or otherwise. And uh, this all stems, as you said, so uh, poignantly from the fact that uh, chi China has been scapegoated for COVID-19 and both political parties have stoked this uh, anti-China propaganda around COVID-19, blaming China for the virus, even making up claims about there being a leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I mean, all of this has really sowed into the minds of Americans that Chinese people are their enemies and anyone that quote unquote looks Chinese, right? I mean, that is how deep basis has come. But of course, this has more than a century long history, more than a century and a half long history in the United States where uh, China has been viewed as this quote unquote yellow peril. And uh, that is all about attempting to meet the geopolitical and imperialist ambitions of the United States and using uh, essentially the Chinese as cannon fodder. And it's even more ridiculous in this age where we have a rising China and more and more people, especially from that region, are thinking that uh, the United States is actually the one in decline, and this spike in anti-Asian racism appears to be a big part of that. Who's doing it? We know it's, who's we know who teed it up, uh, but who's carrying out these attacks? Unfortunately, it's ordinary people. It's ordinary people on the streets of cities like New York, right? It's people who are so frustrated, so. Uh, really keen on looking for someone to blame for their own predicament, right? Because a lot of this has to do also with the economic situation in the United States and how racial tensions are inflamed when you have just this prolonged economic crisis that it was supposedly COVID related. But we found out that actually the United States was on the verge of an economic collapse prior to COVID-19 being recognized on U.S. shores. And so the uh, p increasing poverty levels, the increasing homelessness, the mental health crises, combine that with this daily and endless propaganda coming from the U.S. mainstream media, fear-mongering about China on everything from quote-unquote human rights all the way into COVID-19, and you have this perfect storm, this disaster of ceaseless and needless violence against people of Asian descent. It truly is a real stain and impediment to what we really need in the United States, which is a class war. Well, the, the United States uh, economy was on the verge of collapse before COVID-19 and uh, long before the invasion of Ukraine, though all economic problems were first attributed to COVID-19 and now are being attributed because COVID no longer exists, can no longer be funded uh, because all the funds are going into military hardware. Uh, and of course, it's now being blamed on, on Vladimir Putin. It's him that's putting the gas prices up in the United States. Although incidentally, uh, 
just a stone's throw from El Paso in Texas, just over the border in uh, Mexico, you can still buy a gallon of petrol for three dollars, uh, half the price uh, in the United States. So something quite doesn't quite add up on that. But this searching around for scapegoats doesn't disguise the fundamental problem that the United States society and economy are in fundamental decline. No, it does not. And we even saw that in the recent talks that Yang Jiechi, the top diplomat of China, and Jake Sullivan, the uh, national security advisor of the United States, had, where Jake Sullivan comes into that meeting, similar to Anchorage, Alaska, March 2021. He comes into the meeting already brandishing threats toward China, right? Uh, all of this bluster about how China is supporting Russia through sanctions and something will be done about that. And making up rumors out of whole cloth that China is supplying Russia with military weaponry to essentially invade Ukraine, right? All of these baseless accusations, all to attempt to build up this atmosphere of war going into diplomatic talks, because the United States understands, I think, that it is not in a position to really scale down its military offensive around the world, its endless wars around the world. And it certainly doesn't have much of an interest given how profits are booming for military contractors, US military contractors like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin uh, due to this war, due to the fact that Ukraine has been pumped with uh, billions of NATO uh, weapons over the past seven years since the coup, and that this escalation has only served their interests. And so you have a lot of different sides talking out of different ends of their mouths, but at the end of the day, what it all amounts to is that the United States only really has one trajectory and direction that it can go in. It cannot arrest these forces in the military industrial complex. It cannot arrest these big banks. What they want is to scale up and maximize their profits at the expense of everyone else, and they will justify it by any means necessary. And that means blaming Vladimir Putin when essentially it's the fossil fuel corporations and the weapons contractors that are driving this crisis, or whether it's blaming China, which has been the only major power willing to actually broker a peace agreement at, from the outside, right, to be a good faith third party actor in this conflict, uh, China has been the only one of the major countries to do that. And so it's pretty clear who the real warmongers are, who the real warmonger is, and that's the United States and its allies. By the way, more than 80 members of uh, the United States Congress are significant shareholders in those very arms corporations uh, that you have just cited. Uh, there's not many countries where that would pass without much comment, I must tell you. Uh, but it uh, appears to in the United States. Speaking of uh, Congress, I thought Joe Biden was bad. But I saw a video this week of Nancy Pelosi. And I've got to ask you, is that not, is the face and mind and voices of these two individuals not ex almost Shakespearean, how emblematic it is of decline. It's so very true. I mean, Nancy Pelosi's, it was like a couple of minute diatribe commenting on the Russia Ukraine situation, not really understanding, I think, what she's actually talking about. Uh, she claims she's not a military strategist, but is just throwing around no fly zone, throwing around anti uh, aircraft uh, missile. Uh, carriers, et cetera, and just not really having any insight into the watershed moment that is occurring in the region that the United States is really at the forefront of creating, right? Uh, really provoking Russia to take care of business because of how the U.S. and NATO, through its meddling and outright uh, political uh, manipulation and maneuvering in Ukraine has uh, created this crisis. And so, 
Yeah, Nancy Pelosi, she's a hundred millionaire. She is a product of these weapons manufacturers, these Silicon Valley corporations and big tech companies and Wall Street. And she has only become richer and richer in Congress and therefore more and more detached from the actual reality of working people everywhere that she cannot but help stumble over her words after uh, uh, really putting and helping put the United States into what is a disastrous situation, right? Provoking Russia into this intervention, which now has shockwaves throughout the world's capitalist economy. It's not necessarily uh, the pretty picture, I think, that the militarists, the bankers, and the capitalists all had for uh, the end game with Russia and, uh, by extension, China, right? Uh, this is a potential disaster. And even they, she doesn't really know what she's talking about, but the military strategist who she claims does, they know that something like a no-fly zone, something like a direct confrontation with Russia would spell really doom for the overall global uh, political and economic system of capitalism that uh, she supposedly presides over. But it's unclear how effectively she does at this point, given uh, just <laughs> her state of mind. Exactly. I'm, I'm told she's better before lunch, if you get my meaning. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned earlier how the, the sun is risen in the east, that much even a blind man could see. Uh, but it didn't have to be uh, a zero-sum game, did it? it? We could have had two suns if the West had decided to, uh, to cooperate, to get alongside China and the rest of Asia, uh, to cooperate with them mutually, beneficially. We, we didn't have to have this zero-sum game, is my point. Yes, and Russia and China both have, for the longest period, right, ever since this new Cold War really jumped off with uh, Barack Obama's pivot to Asia in the latter half of his first term, both Russia and China were clamoring really for normalized relations and to ensure that cooperation on the economic, political, and even military fronts was maintained. And of course, what the United States has done since 2012, over this last decade, has continued to provoke, antagonize, and ultimately uh, uh, surround militarily and create a real conflict between uh, both of these countries. And so, while I do not think that Russia and China's strategic partnership is necessarily just a byproduct of U.S. aggression, I do think that there are many good reasons, uh, shared geographic space, uh, lots of interchangeability and interdependency that can be built between Russia and China, Russia, a big energy powerhouse, and China, a big manufacturing and tech powerhouse. There's a lot of commonalities and interests culturally, economically, that these two countries share. but. At the end of the day, it is also true that the United States' aggression has actually facilitated, I think, an acceleration of this multipolar world that Russia and China, through their partnership, are spearheading this idea that unipolarity, the U.S.'s hegemony just being the dictator of global affairs, is outdated and deserves to be revised so that more countries, more nations, more poles can arise around the world and have a say, really really democratize how world affairs are governed. And that's what Russia and China are trying to do. And uh, even up into this Russia-Ukraine conflict, they've been doing a very good job. They have upheld the UN Charter. They have formed incredible alliances economically, these economic integration plans like the Belt and Road Initiative and the Eurasian Economic Union. There is a move to lessen reliance on the dollar, the U.S. dollar. There are just all of these incredible developments and in infrastructure that are being made in this region. And it is having ripple effects in Latin America and Africa, as China especially, but even Russia, are developing stronger and stronger ties with the global south and really connecting what used to be considered the underdeveloped wretched of the earth, as Fanon uh, called them, the colonized world, really spearheading this new phase of development, of growth, of self-determination and independence that 
threatens and I think already has isolated the United States in a lot of ways, which is why it cannot but damage itself and its European allies economically by antagonizing and continuing to try to prolong this Russia-Ukraine conflict, especially with these sanctions, well, which are so counterproductive. Well, uh, we'll be turning to the European allies, as you put it, vassals, one might otherwise say, uh, later in the show. How can people follow your work, Danny? Sure. So you can find me at Black Agenda Report each week. You can also find me on Stub Substack at chroniclesofhaifong.substack.com. And you can find my YouTube show at The Left Lens. You can subscribe there on YouTube. And you can support my work at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. And follow me on Twitter at Spirit of Ho, Spirit of H-O, like Ho Chi Minh. Fantastic. God bless you. God bless your work. Thanks very much, Danny, for joining us.